Yeah. Careful what you say now. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Yeah, on, on the record. record. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the record. That's right. Hot mic. <laughs> you can't yep. see me, but I can still hear you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's threatening. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to keep trying. If I disappear, I might decide I have to reboot or something. Yeah, okay. No. Mm -hmm. Bomb. Well, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody, to uh, brainstorming this uh, human connection here. And uh, we're glad to have you guys here. And it's kind of a catch up today on uh, where are we? You know, we've been doing this. Uh, for over a year now, and we we got this started because we recognize that one of the problems that we have as human beings is that we don't have uh, connections that are stable. Let's say we have it's it's kind of like a, a bad telephone connection where we don't always hear what the other person is saying. And there's a lot of static between what a person says and what the other person hears. And I often reflect on like how complex our human connections are. For example, if we just talk about how we transfer one idea that we have to another person, and we think about first that starts with a feeling, as much as we like to think we're thinking beings, we're really feeling beings that think, not thinking beings that feel. And so we start with a feeling and that rises to the level of a thought. And then we translate that thought somehow into words. And then from there, we make some sounds that tend to support or try to encapsulate that thought. So the words are an imitation of thought. And often the thought is even an imitation of a feeling. It's not really the feeling that we had, but we come up with a thought, especially when it has to do with interpersonal relationships, that are the thought kind of represents a feeling. And then that thought is translated into words, something that represents the thought. And then we use sounds to represent the words. And then the other person hears the words and recreates that as a thought. And then that thought turns into a feeling. And each one of those connections or articulations have the distinct ability to be distorted. And that's usually what happens. And there's always something that goes through a filter that's not quite the feeling that we had, but uh, is good enough or as good as we can do. And then it, the words are as, not really the words that I had in mind or the feeling doesn't really encapsulate what I was thinking, but, or what I was feeling, but that's as close as I can come. And then you depend on the other person to reinterpret that. And they have to filter it through what their experiences are, turn that into a thought, turn that into a feeling. So there's lots of possibilities to go off the rail. So, the idea of this program and this activity really is to give us some practice in articulating what we feel. So I'm hoping that without reiterating that every week, that people get opportunities to 
practice saying what they think and others get practice in hearing what the other person said and translating that into something that the other person meant. And there's, there are two tracks in a way. One is how we feel about it. But before we get to how we feel about what they said, it's important to recognize that we may not have heard or understood what in fact they said, sometimes because they don't know or they don't know how to express what they feel, one of the two or maybe other reasons. But once I, for me, once I recognized how easy it is to misunderstand and be misunderstood, I became a lot more flexible in how I feel about people based on what they say. You know, because I realized that's hard. You know, we're asking ourselves to do really hard work to um, be understood and to understand others. But we have to try. We have to try. Because absent that, uh, it's not good. You know, it's and sometimes we can see evidence of that all the time where it's not good. Um, so anyway, that is the the uh, whole purpose of this. And that said, I want to first do a check in with all of you who would care to uh, share. We are now going through a another wave of this virus, which makes it necessary for us to communicate more this way often than face-to-face uh, -face if we are to stay alive uh, and keep others safe as well. I'm interested in how you're feeling in general. Are you feeling up? Are you feeling hopeful? Are you feeling depressed? Or, there's so many other things that you could be feeling, but anybody, can you tell me how you are feeling right now? Well, the, the first part of the pandemic, the first year, I, it didn't affect me that much because uh, I had a writing job with public broadcasting that I can do here. And a lot of it was by phone. I do a lot of outdoor stuff, hunting and fishing, or at least I did. So I was out and about all the time. It was very similar like what my retirement has been. I was out hunting by myself, my dog, fishing with myself, by my dog, hiking with my wife or my members of my family, staying away from groups downtown and doing all that. But this year I've had health issues that have kept me from doing a lot of that. So I've been more confined to the house and I think that has helped me understand what maybe more people have been going through that I wasn't really going through uh, on this pandemic. And I've faced not only these health issues, but I think the confinement issues that other people, have, many other people at least have been dealing with throughout the whole pandemic. And it, it, it can add to depression, it can add to anxiety. Um, in my case, this ailment that I have makes it difficult for me to read anything very, very lengthy, and that's been a loss for me. And I think everybody in one way or the other has lost something probably during this pandemic, at least temporarily. And uh, it's difficult. I've, I've, for a variety of reasons, I've seen, been seeing a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And uh, I, I just saw on a news story the other day that South Dakota I think had 24% of the people are taking medicine for that. And that was pretty similar to what's going on nationally. And it's up um, during this time. So it's, it's been a stressful period in, in many ways for all of us. Can you say a little bit more, uh, Kevin, about uh, how you're coping with it? You mentioned, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists and that kind of thing, but yourself, what kind of things have you found to as coping skills? Well, 
long walks. We have a we have a nice hiking area up here and my wife and I go up and still, I can do that. I can hike and walk close by. Um, this has been very helpful to me, this connection, uh, because what I think we all lost is community. The community that we were used to having, various communities. And this is starting to give me a little community here that I can look forward to once a week. And, uh, and we build, I think I may have mentioned that I have a little group of, of guys that talk politics, three or four of us, and we would meet in the park, sometimes with park is on or in my backyard, depending on the weather, something, sipping on something warm and, and keeping that connection. Um, FaceTime with my grandkids, you know, especially during the time when nobody was vaccinated and we didn't want to be going to one place to the other and that's been so wonderful to FaceTime and, and uh, to be able to stay connected that way. Um, listening to good books that I can't read these days, but I can listen to. Um, and my spiritual life, uh, um, prayer, uh, time, time alone, both in, in the church and out. My church is closed right now because of Omicron. They shut it down, too many cases. Um, and, and friends. You know, reaching out by phone, by text, by Zoom, and family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think that those are, are, are some very good tips for others as well who may be struggling with something similar and some similar experience. Anyone else has uh, anything they can share? about how you're feeling right now, what you're experiencing now. I can weigh in just briefly that I think I'm kind of on the same track with Kevin in a way, because the first year I wrote it hard and I felt like, you know, it was more like a mission to try to overcome that, the, the difficulties. And there were things like, you know, this group and, and writing more uh, or getting actually writing <laughs> instead of just editing and doing my thing and, you know, maintaining forms of community. But man, I am, I mean, this, it's just gotten long. It's, it's fatiguing and, and, and not, I mean, I, and physically I can, I'm starting to feel it now. And I think it just kind of overtook me and not everything else. And finally, it's just finally getting to the physical. Because it's just, you know, uh, when you come to expect that something unexpected will happen, you kind of have this, that's where the anxiety comes from. Mm -hmm. It's just, it just shows up. I got pinched nerves that I haven't had in 25 years showing up. And I'm like, really? And it's just that, I think it's just, you know, it's that fatigue, it's that anxiety of, you know, I, my family, I didn't get to spend Christmas with them because of COVID, uh, you know, and, and, and it just, I, it wasn't like one thing, but that was kind of like, wow, I got run over at that point. It's like, huh, you know, I felt like I'd been doing the things that I thought were helping me deal with it, but it's just, it's hard to keep that up always, you know, and give yourself time. I mean, that's the thing is that, when you give yourself time, it doesn't, um, I don't know, it's not the same thing when you're in a community and you're used to habits and doing things together and being around people a lot. And then when you don't have that and you give yourself time, you almost feel like, man, I'm, I'm a little worried I'm going to get pulled out by the undertow here. <laughs> <laughs> or the <Yeah>. undertaker. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're running the same in that case. So, I mean, and, you know, coming back and making sure that I stay involved in groups like this and stick with, you know, my groups here and, and getting to talk to my kids, you know, two or three times a week. Uh, thanks to technology, which is, you know, my gosh, <laughs> seriously. Um, it's been a lifesaver, literally. Uh, you know, those things keep me in range, but I really, I mean, I don't know how people could be this far into it and just not really feel it. It is really a drain at this point. It's just so long. 
So, you, you know, I try to glom onto those days when I can really find something and jump on it and just really ride that as much as, as long as I can. And then hold on for the rest, <laughs> kind of, for now. You know. Yeah, good. So those are those are very uh, good ways to, to cope. A anyone else have something they can share about how they're feeling right now or how they have been just really feeling. quick just really quick i wanted to just toss out there um i've always been kind of a person who doesn't mind being at home you know there's that whole go big or go home and people under underestimate how much i would love to go home um but it's there's a difference now like it used to be you had a choice to stay home and now that it's not an option to do anything else but go home it's it causes i think what Todd, you know to what Todd was saying, it's a lot of anxiety. Like you don't have a choice. There's not any agency anymore as far as, you know, what am I going to do? Well, you don't have a whole lot of options. Mm -hmm. You don't have a whole lot of options. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, I wanna come back to that later, but I, I would like to continue now with other people who uh, have, a way that you know what tell us what you're feeling well um i find it harder to be in the present and i think that's so important to be in the moment and be in the present because there's so much concern about the future immediate future <laughs> because of the way things uh, change day to day. You know, where should I go tomorrow? Where do I dare go tomorrow? Uh, should I let my grandson uh, play in that basketball tournament on Saturday? Should I even be letting him go to school? <laughs> um, so there's that. It's, it's, it's harder. I think my state of mind is pretty good except it's harder for me to stay in the present which i've always thought is of utmost importance to uh, live in the moment and fully appreciate the moment and the moment that you have and then in the background of all this is my concern about the country <laughs> uh, where i think another virus is going on uh, and uh, so it's uh it's just difficult, I think, uh, to live without one's mind uh, thinking ahead to tomorrow, literally, and the day after tomorrow, and so forth. Uh, and that's pretty unique to my experience um, because I think I've always been pretty good at living in the present. Learned to live in the present, I've learned learned the value of that and, and now it's it's more difficult especially this this second surge of uh uh the virus probably the second surge of what my concerns are for the country um <laughs> i think those things are are going on and preoccupy me if i let them Can you can you say a little bit more about in the being in the present? What do you think uh, pushes you out of that space? Well, I think I just said it. You know, I'm worried about the immediate future for starters, uh, because I literally don't know what's going to happen, what's going to be on the news tomorrow, and what that Dr. Fauci is going to recommend. And, and uh, what, if anything, the local school systems are going to do about the latest surge? How my loved ones might be affected? Uh, you know, what's next immediately? It causes, so if, it causes more anxiety than I'm used to feeling, is all I'm saying. Oh, okay. So, hoping, but, it, but it's, but it's more, it's a more immediate uh, concern about the near future than I think I've probably ever felt mm -hmm. outside of the experience of war, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe I was misunderstanding what what you were saying uh, when you say you, you know you're having a harder time being in the present because you struck me as a person who does think about what the present has to do with the future and and how the how you might adjust what you're doing to meet future goals. So. So I was misunderstanding you, maybe uh, when you say living uh, in the in the present. I enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Always have. I think I savor it. Even mm -hmm. it's harder to do that now. You know what Chuck touched on too. We have grandkids, of course, and and that's a decision making thing all the time. Not only there their parents are making their decisions on what they do. And then we have to decide, can we help out? They get in the jam, they've got daycare issues, their, their babysitter's sick, school is called off, can you watch the kids? Well, now they're all vaccinated. So it's a little easier that, you know, well, not all of them, but most of them are old enough to be vaccinated. But before we're thinking, can we take four kids in for, the day for two days at this point at our age with the before the vaccination especially um and do we really go to this i we didn't go to a wrestling match we'd have loved to gone to a big wrestling match in sturgis last weekend nobody's wearing masks everybody's wrestling everybody everybody's sitting next to each other with the most by far contagious strain of covid out there ravaging the community well, we didn't go, obviously, uh, but we've been making those kinds of decisions all the time. What events do we attend? What do we not go to? Uh, you know, when I go to them, I, I stand under the scoreboard by myself, fully masked in a room full of people that aren't wearing masks. And then I get out of there before they cl he'll close down. It's a daily life risk-taking. As Chuck says, we're always thinking about the next day. Interesting. Others, how are you? How are you coping, or, or how are you feeling, Mrs. Betty? I uh, guess the one thing that kept coming to mind, and I hate to admit it because I'm not an angry person very often, but I have this underlying feeling of anger because we are where we are, and people have willfully defied the things that made good sense to me. So I just stay home. I, 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 I do go to the store once in a great while, but I don't know when I'm going to go again because I walk in and uh, look around and people aren't wearing masks. Um, it, it makes no sense to me and it makes me angry. So I, I keep a good pantry and I don't mind being home alone. And I love being able to socialize and talk with people here. It's really important to me. <clears throat> so do you have other coping skills, Betty, that you, you might share with us? Oh boy, I, <laughs> I spent my life coping. It's hard to narrow it down, I guess, at the moment. Uh, I coped with the first year almost eagerly somewhat embarrassingly because it was disturbing a lot of people, but I discovered my uh, tendencies to be a happy introvert. And I started reading again voraciously, uh, which I hadn't made time for and energy. Um, I keep in touch with family and friends uh, you know, we can, the, the technology makes that wonderfully available, but I, uh, I don't know as far as coping skills, you know, I, I have my art, I, I've been doing more of that, I'm preparing for an exhibit, that's got my nose to the grindstone right now. I don't have a problem being busy or even just being here alone and thinking my own thoughts, I, I relish it because my life was pretty busy and not very often of my own making. I mean, it was, I understand that, but I always seemed like I was under the thumb of somebody. 
until I retired. So uh, I, I don't know. I just, I, I think I read, I paint. I read, I think, I sit. <laughs> and I do have dear friends and, and relatives. I have great family. So, but we can't just get together casually. It, it's a major deal to set up a family meal around my table uh, for all these reasons. So I think I'm maintaining pretty good mental health most of the time. I put a lot of emphasis on getting sleep and that's helped me, I'm sure, in everything. So I'll Excellent. Leave it there. All right. Thank Excellent. Thank you, Betty. Anyone else? How how are you how are you coping or, or what are you feeling these days? Crystal? Yeah. Um so I think these days I'm feeling um it sounds weird, but I um, I'm feeling uh, a little exhausted, frustrated, but I also feel hopeful. I'm, I'm feeling a little hope because um, unlike the other two gentlemen, that first year, I was like completely like terrified. I mean, I was so, we just hunkered down in the house. We wiped all our groceries with Clorox. We Cloroxed our whole house. Um, I was thinking about care because I care for my mom. She's 96. She lives with me. And so I'm like, we got to be extra careful. We got to take our shoes off. We're like planning a little dressing room outside the house. We could take our clothes off, throw them in the wash and then go in with the robe. Or, you know, we just went like full on, on out trying to fight this pandemic and getting the virus. And we shut the house down. We put a do not enter sign and um, you know, everybody came to visit and they were knocking on the window and grandma would do, like peek out at them in the window. And that's all they could do is just peek in through the window. And so, um, you know, we just we, like took it full force and just hunkered down. And then um, I even went so as far as to buy a little old uh, pop up trailer, because I said, I'm going to buy this and put it in the backyard in case one of us needs to quarantine, get sick, we're going to go out, whoever's sick has to go live in that pop up trailer. So that's how terrified I was. So we bought, I bought that. And then um, after the vaccine came out, you know, I was a little afraid to get it, but just for a tiny second, because you hear all these tales on TV and whatever. Um, but I was more happy. I could have cried when I got my first vaccine because I was so relieved. I'm like, yes, I've got something inside my body now that's going to help me, you know, and we, I grew up, you know, we had to, I had to get vaccinated. I remember being afraid of shots when I was little, crying and screaming, not wanting to get those shots that leave a scar in your arm. And, you know, so when I got this shot, it was like, yay, I'm so happy because now I got something. I'm taking a chance at protecting not only myself, but my mother and my son, who's, you know, who was 13. So now um, after all of that, now I've been vaccinated twice. I got my booster. Um, now with this Omicron variant, variant, it's like, I, I feel like I'm okay. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not as worried as I was the first year. Um, that was worse because I felt now I feel protected to some, I still, you know, wherever I go, I, I mask up. Um, I don't get mad or I don't care if other people don't wear a mask because that's them. I'm, I have no time to worry about them and why they're not wearing a mask, you know what I mean? And and so it's like, my mom is like Betty, she gets real mad. Oh, why don't them people have masks on? And she'll say stuff like, "What?" I'll say, mom, so-and-so got COVID. Well, did it, why didn't they take care of themselves? What are they doing out there that they get that disease? You know, so she kind of, at her age, she's 96, she puts like a little, uh, you, you know, you got a little guilt, built. she puts a little guilt on, gee, you're, terrible person because you got COVID, you know, you're not washing your hands or you're, you know, you're breathing in people's air or you're not wearing a mask. So she kind of thinks like that. But I said, mom, we're vaccinated. We got our booster. We could still get it. The only thing now is it might not be as bad. If we get COVID right now, maybe it won't send us to our deathbed, you know? So I said, that's, that's the only thing, but we still have to be mindful. 
you know, we still, uh, we didn't go anywhere, like I said, that first year, but now, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just like, what helped me through was a lot of meditation that, that first year. I mean, I was not sleeping. I even had to get on some anxiety meds that I still take, uh, you know, like a little dose of it because the doctor's like, wow, you're just way, I was just like, oh, you know, I was just like terrified. Like, I'm going to die. I'm going to get this. My mom's going to die. And, you know, just, it was terrible. And then when my family and my kids got it, I was just like beside myself. You can't go to the hospital with them. My two of my kids ended up in a hospital. I couldn't get there at that time, that first round. It's like, you can't go in there. You know, the other day I went to see my son and dropped some things off in Watertown. And I, I, I just usually knock and I'll go in. And he was standing right there at the door and he said, stop, mom, we're sick in here. We haven't been feeling good. Don't come in. And I had my mask on, you know, when I went, was at the door. So I just quickly dropped the stuff and ran back to my car. And then he messaged, he's like, I'm sorry, mom, but you know, Brandon's been sick and I haven't been feeling good. I just got over something. He's like, we don't know what it is, but it, we're, we're not feeling good. So I said, no, that's fine. Uh, thank you for protecting, you know, giving me that. Because, you know, a lot of times people are vis still visiting and people are still sick. Even like grandkids, we want to... Um, they always come to the house and we're worried that, you know, well, maybe they're going to bring something in and give it to grandma. But my mom at her age, she's like, you know what? I'm 96. If I get something, I get something. If I got to go, I got to go. If it's my time, it's my time. You know, so I try to like not worry about that so much, the death part, because yeah, that is true. We're all going to go someday. But you just don't want to go suffering and not being, you know, not being able to breathe. But then you talk yourself out of it and you just kind of think like, well, you know, they they yeah, I watch people die. So it's like they give you medicines, you know, and it they make it so it's not so um, terrible, you know. So thinking about life, thinking about death and what ifs and all that and worrying, it's like one of my main things is don't worry because you can't change anything you know why are you going to worry what's going on going to happen tomorrow when who knows if it's even going to happen you know so that's kind of one of my coping skills is just uh trying to be quiet and quiet my mind you know and i use these apps one of them is uh i use an app on um i think it's called calm so at night i'll turn this and this calming voice will come on and say breathe, take a deep breath, count to 10, don't worry, you know, and he's got a real soothing, these men and women have nice soothing voices. And pretty soon I'm off to sleep. You know, so that that has really helped me the meditation, those calming apps on the phone at night. And, uh, you know, yeah, life has changed. I, um, I love my big comfy bed, I could just be like, when I get home from work, I'm just like, I'm laying down, I'm watching my TVs, I got my computer, I got my TV, I got my books and, and it's okay. And then other days I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna be in fear today. I'm just gonna mask up and I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna go do that. And I just go do it, you know, and still come home, take my precautions, take my hand sanitizer. And so, yeah, today I'm feeling, um, I was talking to my sister about this this morning. I said, sister, are you, how do you feel today? Like compared to last year? And she said, I'm not as afraid as I am this year as I was that first time, you know, cause now our tribe completely shut down yesterday. They're like noon, we're shutting down. No employees, nobody. We're locking the doors. No one's coming in here. Cause our numbers in Roberts County are like 244 as of yesterday. They went up, you know, like I think 20. So um, it's like, what do you, you know, what are you going to do? We got, like the guy said, you got some people still wrestling, some are playing basketball. We got our college open. We got our casinos open. You know, how do you find that balance without going crazy? And for me, I guess it's just, um, just trying to be, um, hopeful because I'll tell you what, I took it that first year and I about drove myself crazy. You know, I, I did. I really about drove myself crazy just out of fear out of fear, you know, and I think it was, I think it was a legitimate fear because the whole country felt it, you know, but now one other thing I can do is like, I always like, um, I've got a whole collection. I collect masks. I've got all different masks. I like to show them off. I like to wear different ones. I like to um, give people masks. Sometimes I'll carry extra mask and just hand them out, 
you know, to strangers. And then um, I, I just think about things to help people during this time. Um, you know, this morning I was thinking it would be nice to start some kind of thing to help other people, especially elders during this time, you know, and just that helps. That's really helped me a lot is, um, you know, they say when you help others, you, you help yourself. So that's thanks. helped me a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Crystal. I think, Lynn, you wanted to add something. You had your hand up. There you go. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I, I'm probably uh, frustrated and uh, amazed with the stupidity of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Being a South Dakotan and being around cattle and horses majority of my life, mm -hmm. the ranchers and farmers in South Dakota, and I know plenty of them, will vaccinate their cattle and their horses <laughs> or they'll vaccinate themselves. <laughs> you know, I went to cell barn the other day in Pipestone. They got a quarantine pen there. I, nobody's wearing masks in these cell burns. I had one on, and I asked the guy, I said, hey, what the, what's with the quarantine pin? I said, do you know what that's even for? And he's, oh, yeah, let me explain this to you. But they won't do it for their friends or their family <laughs> because it might interrupt their macho image. And the political atmosphere of this whole damn thing is just sickening. I'm going to pick on Governor Christy Noem right away when she was trying to stop Harold Frazier from putting up checkpoints. You know, why are you, why are you mad at people for trying to protect their family and their friends? All because you're trying to please the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. That's where this stuff starts. And normally this year, I'd be in Denver uh, I'm a normal guest speaker down there on Dr. Martin Luther King's day and attending the All Black Rodeo at the Denver Western Stock Show. But this year, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I really don't care about people. If they want to take ivermectin and think that's going to help them, go right ahead. <laughs> oh, you're as stupid as stupid does. And it's like, it's like uh, calling the herd. Got to get rid of the stupid. So die. I don't care. Uh, and people say, Lynn, man, you can't talk like that. Yeah, I can, because if you bring that negativity stuff to me, then get it, you know, I'm just done with it. It's stupid, stupid. I mean, I, I mean, I love people, and, but if you want to be that ignorant, not take care of the little ones, the kojas and the elders, and, and just run amok, then go right ahead. But now with that, I'm you know, I, I stay positive, and uh, but mostly I just want to tell everybody to have a great Martin Luther King holiday. And uh, uh, Kevin's good to see you again, and, and a lot of you guys on here I haven't seen you in a while. But I just want to say thanks to South Dakota and, and Lawrence for doing an awesome job. And love everybody and stay safe and uh, mask up when possible. All right, I'm out. Thanks. thanks. Thank yes, you. Thank yes, you, sir. Lynn. Anyone else? We, I think we're getting some really good uh, coping skills and uh, sharing. Anyone else have something that they're struggling with? Lawrence? Yes, go ahead, Jay. This is Jace. Yeah. Um, I really like how straightforward Lynn is. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of us get really frustrated with some of the people, how, how, uh, how they've been acting and they don't want to wear masks and they don't want to... Um, I don't know, take personal responsibility, but you know, as Lakota people were, it's always important for us to think about the other, the collective responsibility and not just ourselves, but you know, we think <laughs> about our family, we think about our, our takojas, our relatives who we don't want to get sick. And, and so it's, you know, we just, you know, it's not being so selfish. I think it's, that's what's helped me to be able to, to cope thinking that, you know, I'm not the only person in this world. You know, there are all kinds of relatives who need to, to you know, be be careful. And I, and I love them, and I don't want anything bad to happen to them. So uh, thinking about others, and then I've already said in here before that I, you know, I do my daily smudging and I do my prayers and and um, 
I, I think that's really helped me a lot to be able to cope with things. And um, I've been giving presentations on the Zoom things. I, I didn't like them at first, but now at least we can make communication with folks in that way and, and hopefully help others if, if we can. I'm gonna give a presentation on storytelling the end of the month. And I'm and actually involved with the NEH project through Black Hill State that uh, we're doing videotaping of elders um, because we, we were able to get that grant to, to capture, if you will, the voices of our elders who, we, who we're losing because of the pandemic. And so that, that's been exciting. So I think being involved and in, you can still do things, but just have to do things in a different way now. And I, I, uh, I think that um, thinking about others, I think has really helped me to be able to, to cope better and to think about, especially when my three grandkids got COVID a couple of weeks ago and uh, one of my sons and, and uh, I was sick for, I wasn't on here because I was sick for a couple of weeks with the, not the flu, but a bad cold. And, and, it, and I was scared that I was getting COVID or did get COVID. And so I got tested twice and I was negative. And so, but that, it can be frightening because you, you don't want to bring any sickness to anybody. And, and I, and I, that's, that's been a little bit stressful the last, you know, couple weeks in particular. So hope things turn around in 2022 for everybody. And, and I hope that um, our, our prayers are answered and that we can all be well again and, and be close to one another again and hug one another. You know, we miss hugging our, our relatives. So that's it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jace. Um, anyone else? Things that you're experiencing and maybe some uh, sharing of your coping mechanisms. Anyone else? Well, while you're thinking about it, there were some really interesting uh, points that uh, kept coming up. And one of them was how hard it is to adjust to new events and new situations. And it's useful to remember that humans are pretty much creatures of habit. We just don't have the processing power to reevaluate every new situation very well. And it's a human limitation. We're not gods that can be all knowing and all seeing. We don't have real control over things. We react to things and we create patterns. That's actually how the brain actually makes sense of the universe is by recognizing and in many cases creating patterns. And we rely on those patterns to perceive what is out there outside of us or what we perceive is outside of us, but really it's inside of us because we're making it up. But using that kind of uh, framework in which to see how we operate, it's reasonable to see that we do a lot of stuff just by habit. We have to make habits. We have to develop habits. If we wanna change a bad habit, we can't just stop doing it. We have to replace it with a new habit. Otherwise we'll find we're pretty much, we'll go right back to that bad habit because that's how we operate. That's how we uh, move through the universe. So when something happens where that pattern is no longer usable or useful, it can really be disturbing. It can make us feel completely disoriented. And that can be the source of our frustration. You know, it's you, you used to the milk being in one place all the time in the grocery store. And 
when they change it and put it someplace else, that kind of messes up your cha-cha. You know, it's like, you know, it's that somebody put an extra beat in there and now it's hard to dance, you know? So it's reasonable to think that, yeah, we're going to experience some things. So what could we do or what kind of way could we view life and our personal activities that would help us better to adjust to new situations, new uh, challenges in our lives. Is there a habit or a framework, or a habit in terms of like our, our perception or how we, our modus operandi, the way that we normally move in the universe or how we think about things? Is there a way that we can do that that will accommodate the inevitable changes in our lives. Anybody have ideas about how we could do that? When you ask uh, questions, you often have something in mind uh, as far as the answer is concerned. So right there. Uh, how would you answer your own question? Well, <laughs> I, I typically like to give other people a chance uh, <laughs> because I, I don't want to like uh, formulate other people. Well, ideas. that's that's good of you, but you know, we're running out of time, and I'd like to cut to the chase here. I want, okay, I, I really do run out of time. Uh, okay. I'd like to I'd like to hear what the answer what your answer is to your own question. Okay, I'll tell you what I do. Because you pretty obviously uh, cope very well. You, you seem to me to be a person who is able to remain genial, affable. <laughs> well, <laughs> this. So, uh, what do I do? <laughs> so, what are some of your uh, uh, answers to your own questions? How is it that you uh, are proceeding uh, in ways that uh, are helpful to you? Okay, I would say that the at the bottom of it, Chuck, is breathe deep. You know, breathe deep. Uh, that's my go-to thing. And it's also, I learned early, uh, maybe about the time I was 14 or 15 when I was learning how to drive, is you don't look over the hood when you're driving. Because anything that you is over the hood, you already hit. So don't worry about over the hood, look far. And, so that's kind of the framework of like, where is this going? What, how is it developing? That's kind of the baseline. But then it goes to the practice, right? And having a philosophy is one thing. Philosophy while, without practice is useless. You know, it's just some kind of dream thing. You might as well be on acid or something, you know? Uh, so it's the practice. And the practice is trying to, learn new things, be with people that I would normally never encounter, uh, trying to do things that I don't normally do. My house is so full of new projects that I can hardly walk in here, but I'm always interested in new projects. What's the function? How does that work? Why does it work? And how could what normally seems like a failure in this new endeavor be used as something that's the target? That's what you want to do. How do I recognize that? And those kind of brain exercises help me to see possibilities that I would have overlooked before. They help me to see things in people that they may not have seen in themselves. It helps me to see, oh, this person thinks they don't like this person, but you know, in a different circumstance, in a different situation, they could be the best of friends and trying to find various ways to arrange that. It's kind of like a puzzle. It's kind of like a thing to do. So, 
once you in go down that road of practices and it's not just in art work it's in driving like what is another way that i could get to this other place and what would i see over there and what is the advantage of going the slow road over the fast road or taking a detour of five or ten sometimes 20 miles what is the difference in the experience and when I'm not always doing that, when things suddenly change, I almost intuitively go to plan B. So, you know, the, the, the upset that many people experience with their lives being overturned, I really haven't experienced that. I just went to another channel. You know, it's like when I drive to it, when I drive from Roslyn to Sioux Falls, I have to change my radio two or three times to listen to PBS because I go out of the range of one uh, signal, go into the range of another one, go out of another, and I have to keep changing. Now, I could sit there with, you know, 90.9 and cuss at the radio and you went off, you're staticky, or I could change channels, which is what I do. You know, so that's kind of my coping mechanisms in a nutshell. Any other people, I'm sure other people have other ways that they cope with, you know. I, I haven't gotten to eat an ice cream yet, but I think it, under certain circumstances, I could see where that could be a thing. <laughs> I wanted to just emphasize something that Jace said uh, that the last time I looked, indigenous people were the leading ethnic group in the United States for vaccination. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the reasons were the ones she stated. And President Biden this morning called out all of us. Uh, he said, you know, you call it a personal choice, but it's a personal choice that affects everyone else. And and I think the, I think the indigenous people have had that in their cultural in their mindset for longer than I know and uh, certainly appreciate that and it shows up in vaccination rates and also in the way they reacted with closing down reservation uh, roads and uh, getting in a conflict with our governor but uh, that was all driven by that that long historic concern for the community Very good point, Kevin. Very good point. And it's another good coping mechanism is when we think of ourselves as a group and when we see, of our, see what we do as a collective effort, we feel less alone. And when we feel like I'm going to do what I can to protect the group because I have faith that if I get sick, the group will find some way to take care of me. And if without, without the group, I'm nothing in anyway. It's like Ubuntu. You know, Ubuntu is I exist because you exist. You know, I am because you are. And when we have that kind of feeling toward our fellow human beings, we do some things quite differently. When we're not, if we have a non-compete clause with humanity, then that's when we get the most out of our association with other humans. And that's, that's another one of my coping mechanisms is I remind myself of my non-compete clause with other human beings. It's like, okay, if you want that, if you need that, go ahead. You know, <laughs> as long as you're not hurting anyone else, and uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not immoral, illegal, or unsafe, then I'll even help you. You know, go ahead, take that. I'll just uh, add one thing. Uh, in addition to affirming what everyone said about uh, uh, being in good relationship with others and, and helping others obviously the best way to, to help yourself is to help others 
and uh, so reaching out and and uh, being a friend and being a relative uh, wherever you can be and, and a teacher and mentor wherever that's uh, that's appropriate. Uh, my other main uh, coping mechanism, and this has always been the case, but probably even more so uh, now, is humor. Humor is survival. Um, I'm speculating that you have that going on, Lawrence, from, from what I know of you. Yeah, it's and all funny to me. One, well, yeah, one of my favorite poems is Wendell Berry's Manifesto. And uh, he says, laugh. Laugh is, laughter is immeasurable. Laugh, although you know all the facts. <laughs> and, uh, and so there it is, you know. Uh, I find more and more opportunities to laugh. I seek opportunities to laugh uh, because to me, it's inspiriting, <laughs> encouraging uh, to, uh, to laugh at things and to find humor wherever I am. And so I think, you know, ironically, I'm probably laughing more <laughs> in the face of all this than I did before, because I need to. I would say, Charles, I would say, laugh because you know all the facts. That's what Barry <laughs> says. Yes. Barry. It's like, the more of them you know, the more you go, that's different. <laughs> and tribal people, you know, you can't mention tribal people. Uh, they've always known this. You know, we, we talk about Indian humor, but uh, tribal people have really uh, incredibly evolved senses of humor <laughs> um, because humor is survival. It's been one of the ways they've been able to maintain themselves and move forward in the in the world in the face of all the of all the facts. And, and I've always admired that in them, among other things. Humor is so important. I find that even just watching comedy movies change, can change all kinds of things. And being able to find the absurdities in things that are otherwise not understandable, it's accepting contradictions. And if we can't accept contradictions or what appears to be contradictions, then we will we can find ourselves kind of miserable but when we can accept that a person who is otherwise a nice person can do horrible things and a person who is horrible can occasionally do nice things and accept those as contradictions and maybe we don't understand it but we can find some humor in it you know, it's kind of like Lynn was talking about how people who will vaccinate their cattle won't vaccinate their kids. You know, it's the same principle. It's the same idea. That's the reason you do it, you know, but for whatever reason, they can't see that, you know, and they see that it does good for their cattle. They see that they have, you know, their cattle have a better survival rate, but somehow they don't make the connection. I won't say they can't, but they don't, you know? And finding, you know, finding those kind of, of uh, absurdities, to me, that's kind of the basis of humor. And so I find myself laughing at things that are often tragic, but the reason I'm laughing is because of the absurdity of it all. And so it's a coping mechanism, you know, it's one more, coping mechanism. Well, I'm hoping that from this discussion, many of you have found some coping mechanisms, some ways that you might address life that lays before you and find some joy, beauty, enjoyment out of it, because this is a Life is a temporary assignment and it's short. And uh, 
we have to make the best of it. And to me, the best way to make the best of it is helping other people make the best of their lives. Because every person who's happy is one more ripple in the happiness pond. And that has to come back to you. The ripples come back to you. So until uh, next week, uh, we're going to say goodbye, but I want to encourage you to let us know uh, the kinds of things, uh, topics that you might want to have discussed here, because we may be able to go and find uh, an expert or somebody who has history with that particular subject, or introduce it in a way that we can crowdsource solutions or have an interesting conversation. I have all kinds of ideas, but I think it's our program, not just my program. And being our program, I look forward to whatever contributions that you feel that you can make to the discussion. So until uh, next week, same time, same station, thanks for being here and we'll see you. <laughs>